Welcome. Welcome to this very special afternoon and program, um, which is consisting of a talk, a conversation, and a film in honor of distinguished professor Emeritus Donna Haraway sits here, one of the most prominent scholars of feminist studies and the field of uh, science, the history of science and technology. My name is Beatrix Ruf, and as the director of the Stelic Museum Amsterdam, I'm very proud to see this program is so well received, looking at this amazingly fully booked auditorium. For those who were not able to get a ticket for a seat here in this space, I would like to take the opportunity to welcome the audience who joined us via our live stream. It's broadcasted online, as well as broadcasted in the Audi Gallery here in the museum building, and broadcasted in the Beton Salon, the Centre d'Art et de Recherche in Paris, and broadcasted also at the Yale University in Connecticut. So really everywhere. <laughs> Before I introduce the program, I would also like to take the opportunity to thank the University of Utrecht and distinguished university professor Rosi Braidotti to make this event happen in Amsterdam. Thank you so much, Rosi. I trust and I hope that this is the beginning of a long-standing collaboration. The first part of this afternoon will consist of a 20, approximately 20 minute talk by our guest of honor, Professor Donna Haraway. We all know her work since a cyborg manifesto from 1985, a groundbreaking post-feminist essay uh, on identity, technology, but more the interface also of human and the machine, which is very interesting to have this in the series of uh, other uh, theory programs we have here in the relationship to the exhibition of Jordan Wolfson also. Um, in this Cyborg Manifesto, she introduces uh, her new kind of frank trans species feminism, um, her, sorry, I need my glasses. <laughs> Her new book, the 2016 published Staying with the Trouble, Making Kin in the Chutulens, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, offers provocative new ways to reconfigure our relations with the Earth and its inhabitants. She offers an alternative to the trend of referring to our current ep epoch as the Anthropocene and prefers to conceptualize it, what she calls the Stulusen. <laughs> Thank you, Stulusen. Teaching in California in the field of the history of science, consciousness and feminist studies, based um, in technology and the reflections on that, a state actually, which is since a long time one of the most eco-conscious states of the Americas, I cannot think of a more interesting speaker to have here today to enlighten on, on more knowledge. Her latest book, Staying with the Trouble, um, is unfortunately not available in a bookstore physically, but you can purchase it there and it will be sent to you without extra cost. Other books of Donna Haraway are of course available today there. Her talk now will be followed by a conversation between Donna Holway with Professor Rosie Braidotti, the, our distinguished professor from Utrecht. Braidotti is the founding director of the Center for the Humanities, and her publications focus on continental, philo continental philosophy at the intersection of social and political theory, cultural politics, gender, feminist theory, and ethnicity, ethnicity studies. Donna Haraway and Rosie Braidotti know each other for many years, and we'll start the conversation on how Haraway's view on feminism, culture, science, and technology have changed since the cyborg manifesto, and what led to what Haraway finds so urgent today, described in her new book. We will end this interesting afternoon 
uh, with the screening of the film Donna Haraway Storytelling for Earthly Survival. The filmmaker Fabrizio Terranova, who is also with us, visited Donna Haraway at her home in California, living with her almost literally, for a few weeks to produce a film portrait. The film shows Haraway speaking in her own environment, which resulted in an intellectual portrait of one of the most highly original thinkers and gifting story, gifted storytellers of our time. Due to copyright restrictions, the film will not be live streamed. However, as an alternative, we show the film again for a second time tomorrow at 3 p.m. here in this auditorium for those who were not able to see it and to join it us today. I want to ask you now to give a warm welcome and an enthusiastic applause to our wonderful guest. And as I can't wait, I imagine you can't wait either to finally hear Donna Haraway speak. Thank you so much. Okay, is the sound good for folks? Uh, not, no feedback or no, no big problems. If they do develop in the course of my speaking, please have the courage to raise your hand. I, I tell my students that I teach on strong, unregulated, but legal drugs, which is to say the uh, this, uh, corticostero uh, corticosteroids that circulate in my system from my adrenal gland and various neuropeptides and neurohormones, which I simply can't control. And so if there are corporeal manifestations that make it very difficult to understand what I'm saying, I rely upon you and your chemistry to let me know. Okay, <laughs> okay, thank you. First of all, it is a, a tremendous honor to be invited to do this, to do this at, at such an important institution and with the director and all of the staff who have been so amazingly welcoming. And also to do this with my colleague of many years, really since the 1990s, I think, the early 1990s, Rosie Bredati and I have been engaged in a kind of composted nomadology, uh, a kind of, I think of myself as compost rather than posthumanist. Uh, and Rosie has been very willing to um, engage in the kind of layering of the pile for, for its heat and fire. And that we have been passionately engaged in a, con in a conversation about what constitutes the possibility of going on and what constitutes the possibility of feminist partial healing of this earth and all of, all of those denizens of this earth with which we become, that we always become with each other. We are sim-poetic, making with, not auto-poetic, self-forming systems. We are dependent upon each other in tangles and tentacular knots of all sorts. And I feel deeply honored to be in conversation today with Rosie, partly because of the history of these changing and dynamic conversations and some of our shared passions and questions now um, at this moment of intense troubles. I'm also very honored to be sharing this program with Fabrizio Terranova, uh, whose filmmaking is quite extraordinary. His film that he did before me, on Beauvais, um, of course my mind is blanking and my notes are gone. Uh, Fabrizio will tell you. <laughs> Fabrizio's film, I, uh, I am in love with this storytelling for earthly survival film in so many ways, with the possible exception of that old lady who keeps wandering on and talking. Uh, but you can forgive that part uh, <laughs> and appreciate the art of the filmmaker, uh, the art of the film, which I think is uh, something I feel very close to and very astonished by in all the best ways. So I want to start actually with an artistic image that is on the cover of my book and with the title of this very of this book which is uh, which co-appeared with Fabrizio's film they didn't cause each other but they infect each other they have a just by contiguity they change each other in ways that matter to me um, and the book is staying with the trouble making kin in the Thulu scene, the time of the thonic ones, the times and spaces and places and practices of the ongoing earthly ones. The thonic in its Greek root means of the earth. The Thulu scene is the kainos or the time of the ongoing earthly ones. And I wanted to propose this 
um, time place, this um, narrative frame for a moment in which we are besieged by quite other and quite important story, story frameworks like the Anthropocene or the Capitalocene or the Plantationocene, which stories often tend to be so tremendously about onrushing destruction that the sense of ongoingness and living with each other in partial healing gets lost. And my commitments are to staying with the trouble, making kin in the Thulucene, making kin in the thick, ongoing now with earthly others. The artwork um, is a, a print work done by Geraldine Javier, a, a Filipina artist who was working at the Singapore Tyler Prince, Prince Institute in 2009. This is a small piece of her work in that year. And if you'll notice the pelvis that is also a butterfly and the head that is also a butterfly. And you'll notice if you look closely that the butterfly on the head is composed of colored leaves, fragments of leaves. You'll notice the fiber art, the ink, the drawing, the cut paper. You get a sense of the multiple materiality of this untitled figure, which seems to me a figure of the living and the dead, a figure of the, uh, of the sim poetic living with each other in a time of great troubles, but also a time of great um, ongoingness, a time of great uh, working and living and playing with each other for flourishing worlds that may yet still be. So I come back to making string figures with biologies, arts, and activisms. In every case, I think my work from the beginning, even from the Cyborg Manifesto, um, which was deeply rooted, of course, in the information and digital sciences, but rooted in them insofar as they had infiltrated the biologies, that the core of my interest has always been uh, in the living and dying mortal critters of this earth, including in their digital manifestations. And I am very uninterested, or more, more uh, precisely, opposed to the notions of the opposition of the organic and the technological, the opposition of the animal and the human, of the, uh, uh, of the technical and of the uh, fleshly. I'm much more interested in the contact zones, in what is done in the contact zones, uh, in, the, in, the, in the zones of friction, the zones of entanglement. So the Cyborg Manifesto was already a feminist, pro it wasn't, in my view, particularly post-feminist, except in the sense that that means a kind of marked and, and perhaps doing otherwise or proposing something else. In that sense, the post-prefix works, but it was just flat out feminist. Um, it was, a, it was a, a proposal, a proposition, a way of thinking a Marxist feminism that brought together organisms and machines, and not machines all the time everywhere, but the specific kinds of machines that were spewed out onto the earth through the collaborations of World War II, through the targeting practices in gunnery, through the noise reduction in cockpits, through the ergonomics redesign of labor systems, through the digitalization of information that was rooted initially in the experiments of the Bell Telephone Company in the just pre-World War II period. I was particularly interested in those sorts of machines, in the ways that they had reconfigured what we could possibly think of uh, as, our, or, as our organic selves and what feminists needed to do to possess these selves in some kind of way that was for uh, the flourishing of the earthly ones. Now, there's no question that right now we live in a time of trouble which has been reconfigured yet again. We live in a time of systems theoretic reconceptualizations of the Earth that allow the view of the Earth from space, that allow the view of the Earth from space that is named Gaia, and think of the Earth as itself a living, breathing, physiological, homeostatic, uh, self-forming system. Uh, the Anthropocene, this time of, of anthropogenic uh, mutation in the very systemic physiological properties of the planet itself is, is irreducibly a systems concept. Okay? So it's historically rooted in the late 20th and early 21st century and historically rooted in those sorts of historically situated anthropogenic processes the date is always under dispute about when, what you call the year zero. Depends on what your foregrounding and backgrounding in a given story that you're telling. There is no true or false answer to when X starts. It depends on, the, on what 
uh, on what work the story is doing to propose the sorts of axes uh, that one wishes uh, the hearers to pay attention to. Okay. But the Anthropocene is, is relentlessly a systems concept situated uh, fundamentally in the practices of uh, the provocation of wealth the, and the uh, uh, extraction of wealth uh, for productions of certain kinds of limitless growth and inequality that we may as well call capitalism, though that's both too big and too small a word. So that if I had only one word to call this time space that we're living in, I would probably prefer Capitalocene to Anthropocene, in part because it situates the historicity of it, as opposed to the notion that this is a species act, that somehow it's Homo sapiens sapiens that did this fracking thing to us, and it is not. It is an historically situated set of practices of historically situated human beings in relation to each other who have mutated the very systemic ongoingness of the planet itself. Okay. But prior to the capitalist scene and on which uh, the, the practices on which the capitalist scene rests are those massive planet changing simplifications, biodiversity destroying apparatuses called the plantations run for the most part, in, in fact, entirely by forced labor, usually in the form of slavery, but not always other labor systems of coerced forced life and forced labor that were almost always displaced in space. The displacement of plants, uh, plants animals, and people. Uh, palm oil trees are perhaps the most uh, pressing contemporary exam example of the plantation scene. The plantation scene is far from over, even though one thinks perhaps of its generation in terms of sugar, uh, coffee, tobacco, uh, but particularly sugar and the, the great triangle trades uh, that shaped whatever it is that we call modernity, modernity, and certainly shaped whatever it is that we call capitalism, preceded and indeed produced the models of the factories of industrial capitalism. So that again, if we could have only one word, perhaps it ought to be the plantation scene, with its contemporary soybeans, palm oil, corn, so forth and so on, uh, and its historical sugars and coffees and tobaccos. Um, but I'm a kid who always wants to add rather than subtract, okay? I always want to say we need a whole litter, we, ho we need a whole a, a bumptious litter of ways of naming the kinds of stories that need to be told because all of these stories have a kind of um, need to say something that can't be said better in another story frame. So rather than excluding Anthropocene or Capitalocene or Plantationocene, I am proposing something else, partly as a joke, the Thulucene. Uh, it, I mean, to add yet one more sort of Greeky word uh, at this moment has got to be at the very least a bad joke. <laughs> but it's also a serious proposition. I love the sound, that way it, though I love the way it fills my mouth. I love the way it reaches out in a thousand directions. Uh, to the other ways of storing, to other ways of storying the earth. I love its tangles. I love its thonic. I, lo I love its thonicity. That word we really can do without. I didn't say it. Okay. <laughs> I also have a way of thinking that I want to propose to us today, a way of thinking which in, in significant ways has taken over and inhabited me. It is a making with, a thinking with, a sympoetic way of thinking it is perhaps best illustrated or best practiced in the notion of string figuring, cats cradling, the kind of taking up patterns on digits of various kinds, inheriting them, mutating them, dropping strings and ruining the pattern, perhaps reworking strings and proposing patterns that weren't there before. I think of philosophy as a form of string figuring. Philosophical thinking is thinking with. Uh, thinking, thinking with is string figuring. It is a material and materialist semiotic practice. It is a semiotic materialism. It is in many sorts of matter, including the kinds of, of fiber art that you saw, that you could see on the cover of my book. Uh, fiber arts and string figuring in their literal forms interest me a great deal. Under SF, of course, are string figures, science fact, science fiction, speculative fabulation, speculative feminism, and lest we think we're finished, so far. We've gotten so far and no further. We are not finished. We are engaged in the ongoing practice of thinking with, which I propose as a kind of um, visual way, a, a, vis a visualization of what, I can, of what I consider philosophy to be. So think we must, says Virginia Woolf, 
and with my ethnographic friends like Marilyn Strathairn and Anit Singh and many others, I say it matters what stories tell stories, which stories normalize which other stories, which stories hold each other in the air, hold each other uh, in motion in such a way that neither normalizes or fixes the other which matters, which thoughts think thoughts, which ways of doing cognitive analysis of the world think other thoughts, what happens when we become supple and flexible. I found my ethnographic colleagues and uh, also in, uh, indigenous movement thinkers of various kinds, all kinds of thinkers located uh, in various, very specific kinds of movements, critical for coming to understand uh, the phrase, it matters what thoughts think thoughts. It matters what worlds world worlds. The background of both of these last two slides, um, well, actually, that's not true. The background of this slide uh, is a, a crocheted hyperbolic space by the science fiction writer Vonda McIntyre, uh, whose book, Up the Walls of the World, I recommend to you in your copious free time. Uh, this is by La Goldenthal, her Cat's Cradle series a very interesting uh, artist who was deeply inspired the Kaba by the Kabbalah and other, uh, various other kinds of mystical texts, very interesting. I've been deeply shaped by Ursula Le Guin's storytelling practice, by her notion of a carrier bag theory of fiction, as opposed to a matrix space through which the hero moves with his beautiful words and weapons to kill the bounty and bring it home. I've been from the 80s with, um, with I don't know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of other feminists, shaped by Ursula Le Guin's proposing the, narr the, the narrative theory of the carrier bag theory of fiction, the taking up a tiny hollowed out shell because it might hold a little bit of water to share, the taking up of fragments and joining, the making of partial connections, the living along lines and knots, the cosmopolitanism of it, the home and being in motion, the both, uh, this is not a kind of closed parochialism or naturalism of any kind. It is a world making and worldly practice of storytelling. I already said that the Anthropocene is the Earth seen from space. It is Gaia. It is a systemic systems idea. Uh, it works by the feedback systems that have been familiar in science, art, and popular culture since the 1950s and following. Uh, the climate change uh, apparatus that proposes the name Anthropocene is deeply rooted in these traditions. I talked to you briefly about the Plantationocene. I told you something about its rooting in the horrific apparatuses of the triangle trade and slavery and sugar. And I'm sure uh, that's the, obviously the print on, the, on your, I don't know, one of your sides, uh, your left, your <laughs> left, <laughs> okay. On your right uh, is a contemporary palm oil plantation in Indonesia with the sense of the fires in the background as the biodiverse forests are burned down. Uh, and as uh, monocropping proceeds at a level that destroys the mangrove forests and much else, and it's hardly just Indonesia, uh, the soybean in Argentina, the corn in the United States, the pig, the contained animal facilities, the pig factories in uh, in the Netherlands, um, the particular kinds of uh, extractive and destructive processes that I tie to the notion of the plantation of scene. The global, uh, these matters have been global for a long time. They are hardly just invented. The artwork that I like best for thinking about the capitalist scene is actually core supply chain core samples by an artist named Ryan Dewey. Ryan actually took core samples through Walmart and compressed them to make them look like geological core samples that you see before you. It's as if he cored the earth. What he really did was core hyperconsumerism. Uh, he, he took the, you know, the, the sorts of commodities of the big box stores and made core samples, uh, supply chain core samples, which I think is the geology of the capitalist scene. Uh, I, could, I can think of no better way to figure that particular time space than what Ryan Dewey did. Uh, I'm going to move through this very quickly because I don't have time, as if I've been going slow so far, but that's just the way it is. Um, the, the year 1950 is a kind of key moment in the stories that I'm telling. Uh, it, if you will notice in these curves, you don't really need to notice what they're all of, although it's population, gross national product, primary energy use, fertilization consumption, 
um, uh, marine fish capture, tropical forest use, uh, so forth, so on. Uh, an extraordinary array of, of practices on the earth which have inflection points around 1950. What happened in 1950 that changes the rate of change in so many areas of human practice in such a way as to set the Earth on a trajectory toward radical non-sustainability? What happened circa 1950 um, that propels the Great Acceleration? The story frame that I think of for the, the time of the Great Acceleration is the story frame that tells the born and the disappeared, the forced life, the massive forced life of both human and non-human beings and the disappeared, the massive surplus death of both human and non-human in extinctions, genocides, displacements, so forth, such that, as I speak, approximately one out of 113 people on this planet at this moment are either refugees, asylum seekers, or displaced people. That's even a larger percentage of people than people in prisons in the United States, which is saying something. So I finish with some stories of the Thulu scene, the time of the tentacular ones, the entangled ones, the ones of the land and sea who are not finished and with which we must be in sympoetic, energetic, uh, ongoing action, not in optimism, but in the alignment to make lives and deaths worth doing with each other. And it must be a multi-species affair. Environmental justice is all well and good, but not enough. Unless environmental justice is multi-species environmental justice, it is not justice at all. Uh, I said that in the kind of idiom of a biologically educated uh, Anglophone, the same thing could be said in the idiom of the Dakota Sioux uh, Standing Rock Pipeline, uh, uh, the Dakota Pipeline uh, demonstrations of the last year in other languages and other stories. The storying of the earth with its many entities, with its critters, human and non-human, for ongoingness, I call in English Anglophone scientific idiom, environmental multi-species justice. There are many idioms for this, and it matters which stories tell stories. Um, so again, rather than excluding or demoting or worrying about the ongoing imperialism of scientific languages, I will use them in a kind of entangled knotting and friction uh, with the other modes of doing stories on this planet. My um, familiar figure, if you, if you will, my, um, the one who inhabits me is Medusa, the only mortal Gorgon, the Gorgon who doesn't fit any of the Greek lineages, who doesn't add up within the patriarchal apparatuses that produce Zeus and Athena and the rest, who is in, uh, completely uncontainable by monotheisms. Uh, this particular Medusa figure is made of the skin of a giant clam by some students in Washington State in the United States and given to me as a mask. They dug up the clam, they figured out how they skinned it, they figured out how to cure the skin, and they made the Medusa, the Medusa mask uh, as a kind of um, gift uh, for a talk I gave on the Thulu scene. Okay. The sciences of the Thulucene are the sciences also that have displaced the individualistic organisms of the heat engine uh, and of the systems of production and reproduction. You could say in a nutshell that, the, that an organism from roughly the late 18th, early 19th century until somewhere in the middle of the 20th century was a system that had uh, executive functions, systems of labor, reproduction, production, that had motors of, uh, that, ha that you could measure with calorimeters, that is run by heat, that an organism is fundamentally that kind of technological object. In a way, the cyborg argument was that the mid 20th century organisms were that plus information sciences. Okay. Well, I suggest to you that best science cannot be done with these notions anymore, and that the organism is a little bit like Newton's physics to Einstein's. Uh, that it's not, it, it's not like you're not still using it, but it's the wrong idea of the way the earth is, uh, the entities of the earth are shaped, or, or make each other. That the uh, cohabiting each other in order to be at all 
You know that the, the human gut can't form properly without its bacterial infections. You know that the secretions from our gut bacteria are critical to the formation of the young brain. You know that many critters in the world cannot make their own structures unless they make use of the genetic program of associated organisms. In one kind of language, organisms are con constantly outsourcing to each other critical functions that are critical to their existing at all. That in a deep and radical way, ones don't, uh, ones are no, units and relations are no longer the way which, with which one does the world, including scientifically. That the relationalities uh, take the shape in the biological world of holobiomes, that does not mean holist, it means holding together well enough to get through the day, the minute, the nanosecond, the age, depends on the time scale you happen to be interested in. Holding together well enough to get through that time scale in various sorts of uh, connections and disconnections, compositions and decompositions, inclusions and exclusions with other players in the field, a holobiome, or if one wished to be general and Greekish about it, a holoent. Okay? Um, all right, we are all lichens. I work. <laughs> That's a simple statement of fact. That is not, that is not an alt fact. Uh, that is, of course, a story, but it's not an alt fact. <laughs> I have worked with biologists um, and artists constantly in this project. And I call your attention here to a painting that was done celebrating Lynn Margulis shortly after her death. Lynn Margulis is the scientist, the, bio, uh, the biologist, bacteriologist, uh, earth scientist, deeply engaged with the formation of the notion of Gaia with Lovelock, Lovelock in the 1970s, the systems thinking about the earth. But her fundamental contribution to biology is that the modern cell is really the result of infection. Critter A eats critter B, gets indigestion, um, that, that, that uh, Entities in the earth are formed from, uh, living entities in the earth are formed most fundamentally not from sexual connection, but from indigestion, from eating each other, getting indigestion, and being a, a very interesting kind of partial whole. That the origin of the modern cell with its inclusions, its nucleus, its endoplasmic reticula, its mitochondria, especially its mitochondria, its cilia, and so on, are the result of sim biogenetic events, the coming together of entities who got indigestion and were unable either to fully assimilate each other or fully separate. And that that's the fundamental story of life on Earth. Okay. Similar models have been developed for the origins of animal multicellularity with single-celled coanoflagellates that get infected by a particular kind of bacterium that makes them clump and act a little bit like embryos or a little bit like two, two tissue layer sponges. Uh, people have gotten very interested in building models in the laboratory for that kind of emergence of a really fundamental revolution in the order of life on Earth, the, if you will, the invention of animal multicellularity as an infectious event. Um, similar, uh, many kinds of work in biology now go on uh, through studying the uh, power of infectious events. This is a little Hawaiian bobtail squid infected by Vibrio bacteria as a newly hatched little teeny tiny. The Vibrio uh, bacteria secrete molecules that alert the squid to make a little pouch on its ventral surface, um, which will house light-emitting uh, bacteria when the squid is an adult so that when the squid is hunting along the bottom of, the, the bottom of its habitat, uh, it will glue sand to its back, but it will look like the starry sky from below to its prey because of its light-emitting symbionts. Okay? So it doesn't cast a moon shadow, and it looks like the starry sky uh, as the little squid goes about hunting. This, the formation of this pouch is dependent upon an obligatory infectious event in early developmental uh, processes of the critter. These are general properties of life as we know it now. The art projects that I think work much the same way, bringing together activists, fiber artists, mathematicians, um, artists of other kinds, such as the crochet coral reef done by Margaret and Christine Wertheim in 27 countries with 10,000 co-artists, co co-workers, uh, po possibly with the, perhaps the exception of the AIDS quilt, the largest collaborative art project on Earth. 
um, crochets hyperbolic surfaces, excess surfaces, as a way of creating a kind of intimacy without proximity with the coral reefs of the world, uh, building uh, unbelievably interesting fabulated coral reefs, toxic reefs, bleached reefs, um, crocheting with discarded plastic bags, discarded reel-to-reel -reel tape, dis uh, crocheting with all sorts of materials uh, to build with each other th uh, through crocheting uh, the excess surfaces of the vulnerable coral reefs of the world as a way of cultivating a kind of attention, a kind of caring, a kind of environmentalism. Other art projects I've worked with, but I'm not going to have time to talk about today, bring together in every case artists located uh, out of a specific kind of caring about the world which, with, to which they feel responsible, working with scientific ideas, working with other activists, uh, to do something in the world which intensifies the caring, intensifies uh, the making the world a place in which one can live. As you stay with the film, you will find at the end uh, of, of Fabrizio's amazing film, the stories of the children of compost, the Camille stories, a kind of science fiction story that Fabrizio, Vincent Desprez, and I and others started together in Normandy at, Cer at, at Cerisi in a week uh, colloque uh, in Cerisi, I don't know, three years ago now. And uh, I've been writing the Camille stories ever since, and they are the last uh, more than 50 pages of Staying with the Trouble. And they are about the symbiosis of a human child and monarch butterflies uh, in communities that endure for about five human generations. Uh, so I recommend the film to you and the stories of the children of compost. And I conclude with the Euroboros, the snake eating its own tail. We are the grandchildren of the witches you didn't burn. Rosie and I now take Roman positions on the red couch. <laughs> it's such a bad bag. Wow. Uh, where to begin? Engaging with um, Haraway, <laughs> making keen and person. falling apart. <laughs> is really entering a galaxy. It, I always describe Haraway as a planet, a galaxy. It's so enormously complex, um, rich, generative, and mesmerizing in its charismatic force. I always wanted to go on, really. Um, uh, what conversation is possible after this um, is a challenge, to say the least. We have been transposed companion species for decades, and, and our conversations are all parallel, entangled, zigzagging, in and out of each other's material semiotics and semiotic materialities, uh, held together by a passion for critical thinking on the one hand, and enormous love for the world, let's face it. We are very vital critters, and, uh, people who care tremendously and forget to forget so many things that keep us thinking and keep us going. So thank you for the gift of this friendship that stretches across time forever and ever and multiple galaxies and multiple Camille stories. So I see my task today, apart from celebrating and co-thinking with you, is sort of trying to open up more tentacular entanglements out of this new a fantastic book that comes with a movie, that comes with a website, that comes with all the people who are listening to us, wherever you might be, little virtual creatures out there. Thank you for being with us. Um, but we've got her in the room, and you don't. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's start in the middle, the only place to start. It's overwhelming in this particular phase of your work how present art practice is. Um, uh, the artwork, the artist, the visualizations, the multiple layering of that. And uh, of late, uh, we've gone from the, the pseudo-proto-robotics of the cyborg um, through the companion species in all of their multiple organic um, formats 
two very textile, very crocheted, knitted material artworks. And they seem to be actually prominent, not, not taking over, but very, very prominent. Given that we are in this magnificent museum, could we start from there? And are you really a conceptual artist at heart? I think that um, progressively as um, I, I have worked over the last, I don't know, 40 years, um, I am struck by, I'm, I'm a very visual person and I'm a very oral person. Words, oral and oral, words fill my mouth, they feel very physical. Um, and I'm very drawn by color and by movement and by design, by graphic, by, um, I'm, I'm not anesthetic. I don't work by simplification, and I am rarely drawn by art, art that works by reduction. And I'm a polemicist, an ideologue. Uh, I think doing good propaganda is something we really ought to figure out how to get better at. Uh, I'm really interested in propaganda as a form, of, um, as a form that need not be uh, you know, full of alt anything, that it can be a practice of collecting each other up and telling important truths with certain kinds of tonalities. So I'm drawn by artists, particular artists, who, feel t who, who draw me with, with images, with sounds, with words, with patterning. Certainly, the, the, uh, from the earliest period, it was fiction. Okay. Um, not poetry, really, uh, which, is to, uh, which I regret. But um, I, mean, I, don't regret it. I don't regret the fiction. I regret being tone deaf to poetry um, it, way too long. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but drawn uh, fairly early on by um, the beauty of the, of the living world. I think one of the reasons that I work by addition and by excess surface, by always kind of adding on and complexifying and nodding and, and spewing in a way, is because of um, the, the grip of the living world, the grip of biology as a discourse, in the grip of the living world, and the grip of artists who are deeply rooted in, um, they're just the off the, you know, the off the scale uh, beauty and excess of uh, living critters. So I'm drawn by excess, and I'm drawn by artists who are engaged in it, um, and especially artists who are, who are taking it up visually. I think of Lynn Randolph in the, in the period when I did the Cyborg Manifesto and her painting, uh, I'm drawn by her, her uh, sort of crazy imagination, her nightmares, but also her, her use of uh, strongly narrative work in a period when abstract art was about the only thing that got you ahead professionally. I'm, I'm interested in the way women resist what is supposed to work to get them ahead professionally. Um, uh, and in, in every case, every, every piece of work that I've done, um, really since the Cyborg Manifesto, at least, is, is related to a particular named uh, set of artists and art practices. Um, I worked with, with uh, you know, Holly Hughes uh, in, in some of her dog performance art, uh, so on. You know, more and more my work is just um, in conversation with particular artists. And it, it's contingent, it's opportunistic, it's not systematically searching an archive for something. It's being, uh, it's, it's the kind of whiplash that certain kinds of images give me and make me want to, to know, make me want to know this, this practice. This <clears throat> resonance between the artwork in this multiplicity, organic, post-organic, reconstructed, and the process of thinking is one of the defining traits of your work is one of the things that unites us as well. I could be sort of a classical academic and say this is actually a strong connection between the imagination and reason, between the, the creativity and the critique, and between the analytic and the more, um, not normative, but utopian, almost programmatic. Uh, I'm sure you're sick and tired of hearing this, and, but people always describe you as one of the most charismatic speakers um, on earth. And it's clear all of us were mesmerized the moment you take the floor and this force of nature culture hits you. Is there a, is there a, a, a sort of a, a backlash to this? I mean, oh, yeah. do you get sick and tired of being described as this charismatic, imaginative, 
powerhouse? Would you rather be described as a really boring, stuffy philosopher with a strict, strict methodology? Can we, can we go there on the issue of, of method vis-a-vis uh, -vis the charismatic, imaginative powerhouse? Surely I don't have to choose between those two. Uh, <laughs> no, I get, I get deeply tired of the, um, uh, you know, Haraway is a lot of fun, but on the other hand, what is she really saying? Uh, you know, this is all full of force and sound and fury, but after all, are there any arguments here? Uh, and I would like to maintain that, that if one uh, takes up either the lecture I just finished or any of the written materials, that they are full of arguments uh, and they are full of a rather carefully worked out uh, historical research and philosophical work and reading with others in uh, recognizable webbed not genealogies. Um, and that I feel quite strongly about, um, sometimes quite angry, that, uh, for example, some folks in science studies a few years ago uh, did the charismatic number, uh, but uh, they simply didn't read the work. <laughs> <laughs> or if they read it, I, I'm glad I wasn't their seminar teacher in the relevant years of formation. Uh, I think the practices of close reading are really important, and I think my work takes close reading. And I also think my work takes a certain kind of letting go, um, a certain kind of confidence that says this particular thinker is deliberately working through practices of string figuring and partially connecting and interrupting stories with stories and ways of, um, of um, in moving arguments through uh, by infecting them with other arguments and then seeing what happens, that she uh, is aware of and uses certain kinds of dialectical technologies in the writing and speaking, but they aren't in the end dialectical, they're doing something else. So uh, there's a multidisciplinarity involved, but it's not the multidisciplinarity that requires anyone to be an expert in any of the fields that are being mobilized. Because the books and the talks always give enough uh, to clue in, uh, partly by remembering what one already knows, and partly by having the confidence to let go of the, dis of the, um, the, the, uh, the imperative to work uh, by knowing A, B, and C first before you do D, uh, and that works by, uh, look, these are the philosophical strains, and those are the biological sciences over there, and here are the literary influences, and there are the visual artists, and, and uh, there are so forth, that the, the work that I do deliberately uh, and uh, consistently uh, mobilizes these multiple materialities in making their arguments, and also deliberately multiple uh, mobilizes a citation apparatus that tries to give some sense of where this, of what enables this work. The crowd that is in your whole self when you're performing. Uh, the, the citation apparatus deliberately includes conversations with someone who never published, as opposed to having to have a paper peer reviewed before you'll cite it. Okay? Um, because I am extremely interested in performing uh, the practice that is thinking. Uh, so I, I'm, in, I'm interested, I feel like when I perform, I feel in some sense like I'm channeling. Like there's some sort of something, um, call it, uh, you know, those illegal drugs or those legal endogenous drugs, that there is a way in which um, whatever it is that we do does us, uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in whatever it is that is, too. But it's not instead of my extremely strong stakes um, in uh, rationality. Because I'm, I'm not willing to throw that word out at all in what this is about. And this resonates big time with my nomadic thinking, of course. Can I sneak in another one quickly, just to conclude on this? People describe the, our era also as a post-theory era, a theory fatigue period. Um, I prefer to think that we're going through a period where theory is being weaponized, um, where there's, there's a lot of theory in the White House. It's just scary theory uh, about the necessity of a world apocalypse to get on to the next phase of human evolution. Would you accept, would you accept the definition of yourself as a theoretical pacifist, somebody that 
objects to the weaponization of theory. And thinking with, becoming with is a t actually a vote of confidence, an act of love for theory as a binding force, which I would call affirmative uh, rather yeah, than Yeah, I negative. think that's something you and I have shared from the beginning. Uh, I think both of us are theorists. And I think that theory making is learning how to make peace and make peace as mortal critters, not as transcendent critters, to make peace as living and dying with each other. Um, weaponizing against death seems to me the story that has informed theory as we have inherited it in most of our Western apparatuses of politics, science, and philosophy. Not all of them by any means, but very dominant. Uh, and certainly in the, in the contemporary White House, one le need look no further than Steve Bannon who had been the CEO of Breitbart, but I'm thinking now particularly of his, uh, his uh, theory of, of civilizational war, his deep, think, his deep thinking about the long civilizational war, war of Christianity and Islam and the necessity of ongoing war. Um, this is uh, a, a deep commitment by one of the most powerful men on earth right now who works Trump like a puppet, I think. Uh, and I think theory is far from, we can't afford to be tired. Furthermore, we're not tired. We're not. <laughs> we, are, we are truly legion. We truly are the grandchildren of the witches they didn't burn, and we're not done. <laughs> and you know that Italian yeah. feminism was born with tremate, tremate, le streghe son tornate. Fear, fear, the witches are here. I hope that the Russian intelligence service that is listening in is going to relay this to the White House. <laughs> time for questions, I think. <laughs> yeah, we have some questions from the audience. We have a little time. I think. Oh, you, I chair the questions, yes. It's open for questions now. We're going to cluster them. Don't be intimidated. Um, all questions are good. We have uh, like 30 seconds for it, but uh, <laughs> grab your chance. <laughs> Don't think you have to hurry. Door <laughs> <Lower> is open. <laughs> Who goes first? Um, I'm wondering how you see your practices overlapping in terms of theory and what exactly your kind of interests are that come together and where you might diverge in your theory making. I said that we would cluster them and uh, more. Two, three questions and then Donna and I. That, that, that was it? Nobody else there? Hey, Bruce, where are you? You're very good at this, uh, Rosie. <laughs> You're very good at this. Um, a uh, very short will there be a moment when we have to imagine the death of Gaia the death of, the death of Gaia. Gaia the death of Gaia oh. <laughs> <laughs> do we have a third question or do we stay with the diet okay last, last one for this cluster You talk a lot about the theoretical aspects in the after conversation now, but I'm curious also how this feeds back into practice and activism in this side of making things material again. Right. Over let to me, Don. Go ahead. Uh, let, me, let me answer in reverse order. Uh, and I want to talk about the practical kinds of engagements that are, that are in play and at stake. All right, I want to talk about the practical engagements that are in play. Uh, the kinds of activisms uh, going on. Um, I think of the, the, I propose the Crochet Coral Reef as simultaneously, simultaneously an activist project and an art project that draws people together in conservation, uh, in reef, reef conservation context. I also think of the, um, another example would be the uh, electronic game making work uh, that's going on in the Never Alone game making. Uh, in the Cook, Cook Inlet Tribal Council that engages the elders and the kids in the community as well as the game makers both locally and from Seattle uh, in ways of uh, developing a, um, a computer game that um, both performs certain kinds of, of elder stories but performs in particular a young girl facing the, the storm that threatens to destroy her community and facing it with the Arctic fox and the various spirit helpers in ways that bring animism and, uh, and uh, non-human others who are um, not technologies but non-human other players into the, into the world of worlding. It's a game practice that, that I think of as also activist in engaging the youth, engaging elders, engaging complex communities uh, from different sorts of places to propose, uh, to propose worlding, a world game in their view. 
Uh, I'm also looking at the kinds of performance art that goes on in almost every political demonstration that, that one um, attends, the kinds of um, imaginative modeling of ways of living with each other in experimental kin-making groups. Uh, I think of those as activist projects and also in some no small way art projects in the sense of storying possible lives. Making kin, making kindreds is a kind of practice, activist practice I'm especially interested in, and so on. Uh, it, can I imagine Gaia dying? Uh, I think there's no question that from a cosmological point of view, the, uh, the, the Earth is uh, itself uh, a temporal entity. Uh, and the metabolism of the Earth in ways that support life could go the way of Venus, though that may not be very likely. Uh, that is to say, it could become a dead planet that used to have life on it. Uh, those, I think, are interesting scientifically, but what interests me in relation to Gaia is whether it is or is not possible uh, to uh, engage in the kind of work with each other now that makes uh, uh, a kind of living together with human beings in multi-species partial healing and flourishing through the coming few hundred years, where many of the onrushing extinctions cannot be stopped. Loss has already occurred and is in train. Much is irreversible. A great deal must be reformulated. Much is already being done. Nobody is starting from scratch. There's way more happening than we thought and less than there should be. Um, I think it is still possible, though I think we have a window of opportunity, I don't know how long it is, uh, to engage with other human beings and with other critters on this earth in our situated complexity, addressing the questions of permanent war and ever-escalating extraction. Uh, I think it is possible that, that um, failure will occur, but that, in, that doesn't interest me very much. Futurism does not interest me. What interests me is the commitment to the kind of multiple scales of time and, time and place of living with each other for ongoingness as mortal entities. Um, so that's within Gaia in a sense, but I think of it as more uh, aligned with the tentacularities of Medusa than with the, syst the system's properties of Gaia, which is really a figure oriented around a different kind of conception of time. Uh, so I think it is possible for ongoingness and peacemaking to be strengthened. Uh, but, uh, but I do think there is a window of opportunity here. Uh, of what? Decades? A few generations? I don't know. Um, but it's not forever. Yeah. We have a complex last question that we don't know how to deal of with. Of how we interrelate <laughs> with each other. <laughs> Basically, I was thinking about how both of your early, earlier work dealt with um, biological production and thinking about reproduction as technology. And I'm wondering how that's played out in both of your later work and how there's some mm -hmm. yeah, kind of overlap in that. Well, it's perfectly true that Rosie and I and zillions of other feminists on this planet could not but pay attention. Uh, to the semiotic materiality of making persons, making babies of, of I'm avoiding the word reproduction, uh, because it has such a, a historically situated time place. But the questions of reproductive freedom and reproductive justice um, infuse Rosie's and my work in a whole lot of ways. And this is true of, of feminists of our generation, but not only of our generation. And I think that in an ongoing way, Rosie and I continue to be consumed by the question of making kin, uh, both biogenetically and not biogenetically. What making kindreds uh, that have a chance with each other on this earth are going to be like? I think a good bit of Ro Rosie's nomadology uh, has to do with making kin. And that's yeah. the center of what I care about. Yes, rapidly, because time is running out. Of course, the differences are differences of location, being situated in a European university system as opposed to being having the freedom of an American Santa Cruz um, university system. The quest for multidisciplinarity as opposed to a, a kind of a love-hate relationship to philosophy, which is a, a terrible disease that one never, ever really gets over. Um, but the fact that I work with philosophies of life, um, whether it is the yeah, Deleuze, yeah. the, the Irigaray, the French philosophies of life, I think, is the point of contact. And the work of the more speculative edges of science theory, which is represented by Haraway, uh, allows philosophers to jump out of our terrible, um, manic, um, depressive modes 
and actually reach out for a, a, a generative form yeah of multidisciplinarity, a rigorous one that we don't get elsewhere. I think the conversations between science studies, continental philosophy and feminism, queer theory as the great um, anti-racist theory, as the great bridge makers. And I think that is a generational trait. And, uh, and I think I, I've come to see philosophy as some sort of occupational d disease, as some sort of a, a illness that you never recover. And, and it gets worse in case you have it too, it gets worse with age. And the love for philosophy grows uh, as one grows older, so be prepared. Yeah. Uh, and what I admire, of course, in Harav is a tremendous freedom and the fact that she can say, I actually quote people that are not published. And in philosophy, you do that at your own risk and peril. Yeah. <laughs> we do it, but it's... A, so I think it's that, that yeah. game of, of great, a great inspirational force, but great rigor in, in, in our methodology. Yeah. This would take six months of a serious seminar to do properly, but yeah. uh, as I think my, one of my young um, collaborators is, is actually scanning my art archives, and young Yannick was sitting in the audience, as she was saying recently, I've been scanning your correspondence and your, and your research files, you all know each other. And, and it's a generation that is a network, we do come from the women's movement, we do know each other. And I think that has become for me now also in the eyes of the younger generation, a source of great strength, a great pride, but these are relationships that are crafted and cultivated yeah. over long periods of time, they don't just happen, we were propelled by history, but we did the rest. People think with friends. And in, in the, I mean, it, <laughs> no, <laughs> we don't think alone. And in the, in the simplest possible sense, Rosie shaped as a philosopher and I'm shaped as a biologist and we're both in love with the world. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> I think we have room for one or two more questions, says the boss, and the hands are up. And, and now we have six, of course, it's always the same. <laughs> this will be the last round, so. <clears throat> Yeah, I was wondering how do you imagine the end of the Capitalocene or the transformation of the Capitalocene into the Cthulhocene, which I see it as a more um, optimistic, uh, hopeful um, a time place. Um, yeah. In the sense that it is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. But That's the yeah. question. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's, have, let's cluster the questions. Um, thank you. I was wondering if you could say more about how you're using Earth. And I ask that in part because it sounds to me, um, at first sound, like it risks drawing inclusion through territory. And I'm just wondering if we haven't had enough of that. So if I could just hear more about what Earth is. Earth. Do we have a third question or this is it? Oh, six, seven, yes. eight. Okay. What do we do, boss? We are We're running out of time. So we're stopping here. Sorry. <laughs> um, sadism here. Over to Donna. The end of capitalism, oh, yeah. right. Uh, well, I think they're doing a good job uh, doing it to themselves. No, that, that's, I don't believe that. I think that, that um, I rely very strongly on the kinds of uh, political thinking, thinking and political theory of a critical left that attempts to imagine ways to both understand what's going on with the financial apparatuses and with the possibilities of derailing them, what could possibly uh, happen in a world that is more and more driven by roboticization and the, and, um, uh, the, the absence of work for just for ma uh, masses of people on the earth, particularly an earth of 11.2 billion people in a very few years. Um, I, I don't have a theory for the end of capitalism. I rely on and ally with social movements and theoretical formations um, and try to contribute to it um, through a, a kind of labor of imagining living otherwise. And the Thulu scene is not so much optimistic as a, as a statement that this is not about the future, it's about now. That we are already in the midst of powers and processes and practices that are not contained by the capitalist monster. And we need to grow them. We need to, we need to connect and grow these things. Um, it's hopeful, certainly. It refuses cynicism, it refuses skepticism, it refuses techno-fixes. But it certainly allies itself with technological projects with urban projects, with various kinds of um, uh, land use and land redesign projects. I'm certainly allied with different kinds of agricultural, um, uh, agricultural work that goes on in, the, uh, in many places in the world. 
Um, so I feel like it's polycentric for me, and both for, for good and for ill, I am, in, I am unconvinced by the large centralizing theories, but needy of theory. Um, Earth. Um, I understand what you're saying about territorialization and the rest of it, and I think the question of place and where, when, who is, and at what cost with who else um, uh, is perhaps a better idiom than talking about, I'm trying to avoid talking, I, you know, when I talk about a planet, I do it with a kind of, you know, how dare one talk with a category like that, uh, or with Terra, or with Earth. Uh, these are these are imperializing, and these are concepts that have allowed a visualizing of an earth for extraction and for movement of resources from there to here for the benefit of some and not others. I know this, um, and I know these stories are relentlessly contaminated, uh, and I, I want to interrupt them, and I want to, to make them complicated, but I also don't want to throw them away. I'm interested in speaking as a mortal critter of... of uh, of, a, of an earth that is, that is, you know, get it, is composed of many kinds of complex, uh, complexly connected time places. Um, so I don't, I try not to work with the um, imperializing from the top visualizing apparatuses of carving up the earth into its various kinds of projection spaces. Though frankly, I'm quite interested in that kind of modeling and I think some important work still, got do still gets done by various kinds of abstracting processes of something as, whole, as big as a planet. Um, so I know what you're saying and um, I don't know how to do without. Um, uh, Terra, Earth, um, the, the 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 time places on which mortal at, at which mortal critters are at stake. Part of the excitement of meeting, encountering a supernova like Haraway is the frustration that it has to be limited in space and time, and uh, and it's part of it. So swallow the tears, but we do have to draw this to a close. Um, and before I ask you to, to thank this thinker that comes to us from some sustainable future somewhere, uh, I will announce the rest of the program. I think we are going towards a short presentation of the film by um, the filmmaker Fabrizio Terranova, who is somewhere. And after that, you will get to see the film um, and to get more of Haraway mediated. How do we thank her? With love, with enthusiasm, as forever. Donna Haraway! Yeah.